much, Marilyn, um, for inviting me here, really, and for finding the subject flavorsome enough. Um, last summer, when Marilyn asked me to give this talk, it was August, actually, so quite some time ago. Um, I hadn't actually computed that today would be a week to the day to the start of Ramadan. So, in fact, the timing is really, really apt because um, Ramadan is a time where, in Arabia especially, the most thoroughbred of dishes make an appearance at the Ramadan table. So I'm really glad and it's very, very timely for me to be here. Um, whenever people ask me what I do, and I always say that I write and research about the food of the Gulf and Arabia, I'm always met with puzzled looks and um, usually silence. And then the question, really, Arabia has a cuisine? And I think there has been a conflation to some degree between Middle Eastern food and Arabian food. And they are different things. Um, so what then does Arabia eat? I've come across many books, many cookbooks with Arabia in the title, but none of them could explain to me how foodstuffs reach this barren amount, or why there exist different variations between dishes eaten in Riyadh and dishes eaten in Jidda, both major Saudi cities, but residing in different sides of the peninsula, or why Yemenis from north and south like to eat and bake so many different types of bread, I mean dozens of types of bread dishes. So, for me, really, it's always whoops, <laughs> very useful to look at the map and remind myself just how large the peninsula is. And really, the, the largest in the world, the largest peninsula in the world. And from coast to coast, the topography, the geography, the peoples are different. Um, the, um, so, Eastern Arabia, for instance, is a, uh, an area of marshes and coastlands. Um, also, desert areas in the interior, mountainous regions, and central plateaus. We've got the largest continuous sand desert in the world, the Rub al-Khali, the empty quarter desert. Um, we also have uh, desert palm oases, um, as well as, of course, the cities of merchants. Western Arabia, um, mountain ranges, coastal areas, dry flat plains, and coral reefs. Also, the ancient cities, cosmopolitan cities of pilgrims and traders. Um, also, neighboring it to the north is the Levant, an influence that has seeped into its cuisine, to the north, the Yemen. Um, and so, we have really quite a diverse topography and a very diverse history. And Arabia, like most regions, is a Arabian food, is a product of climate, geography, its very unique history, but especially its location. And really, the location at the, um, these two, um, uh, the crossroads between all these different currents um, and these trade routes that went far and wide. Um, and so, I like to think of them in my, in my work as an Eastern Arabian kitchen, Khaliji slash Neji. And by the Khalij, I mean the countries, uh, the totality of the countries along the coast. Kuwait, Bahrain, Qatar, the UAE, Saudi, and Oman, and Najdi, the areas of the interior. And I think, and these these uh, places share very much. They share cuisine, and this cuisine is very heavy on grains, Indian spices, lots of pulses, a profusion of rice-based dishes, lots of lamb, lots of fish, and of course dates. And I also like to think of a Western Arabian cuisine. Yemeni slash Hijazi, and Hijaz is this area, like I said, south of Yemen, Saudi, um, sorry, south of Jordan, Saudi, <coughs> and Yemen. And um, the western part of Arabia, also lots of grains, but also bean dishes, lots of locally harvested honey and ghee, <coughs> fenugreek, lots of fenugreek in their food. Um, as well as um, uh, locally harvested grains like millet and barley and sorghum. And even within these, these categories, we have crossovers, a lot of crossover. Uh, north and South, Amman, for instance, it's really worth noting, Amman, because of its history with Zanzibar, has a lot of different flavors that the rest of the Gulf wouldn't have. Yemen, of course, North and South, also different cuisines. So it's really difficult to generalize but I think it's very useful to think of them for us today as East and West. Um, and I would like to start by looking at the Eastern part, more specifically, the Gulf countries. And because Ramadan is in a week, and because Ramadan is a venue where the most thoroughbred of dishes make an appearance, I'm going to start with the iftar table. And this is my aunt's house, Amma Hassa. She lives in Kuwait. 
And, and her home is really the hub, the Ramadan hub, where all the cousins gravitate around uh, this time of year, be it winter or summer. And um, she has been cooking her whole life for everybody that she can cook for, really. Um, anyone who will eat her food. And Ramadan is a very special time because her kitchen is open to everybody. Not only family and friends, but lots of people popping in, lots of drop-ins, lots of workers as well from the neighborhood. This is an image of her car. This is the pre-Ramadan shop, the date shop. And you can see the quantities of dates. That this is just the one trip. The car went back three times to the date shop. And this is very typical, of course, of the Khalij, because you have to stock up on dates, because dates are such a staple food at that time of year. They're also a food that you would give as a charity in mosques and so on. And I also wanted to capture this image of her pot lids. And of course, they're monogrammed. Um, if you can read Arabic, it says, Ahmed Abdul Latif al Hamad. Um, a lot of older ladies have these pot lids. And it's because of the significance of, of food in our, in our societies and how important they are as a social cementer, not just a nutritional, something you, you do, something you eat, but it's also a social agent. You would send food around to family and friends. Um, if you piss someone off, you'd sell it, you send some food. Um, if there's a, there's a celebration or, or some sort of wedding, you would send food. And of course, you wouldn't really want to lose your pot lids. So, um, so this is, this is the venue for a Ramadan dish, uh, a Ramadan iftar. And these would be a selection of the dishes that you'd find um, on the table. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail about them because we're going to go through uh, each category separately, but I just wanted to give you a flavor of things to come, an idea of the different colors, the textures, but also an idea of the different influences that have that have gone into the cuisine of the uh, eastern part of Arabia and the Gulf. Um, and of course, dates. Dates uh, are the first thing that you break your fast with, first thing to touch your lips. Uh, they're absolute, they're an essential part of the Ramadan experience. Um, but in the case of the Eastern Gulf, uh, Eastern Arabia and Gulf, they are also a sweet reminder of a time not so long ago when they were traded far and wide as a cash crop. I don't know um, how much you know about dates, but pre-oil, they were the region's main export. And um, they were exported on these vessels called dows. Um, they were beautiful, elegant vessels. And dates and dows really go hand in hand. Dates and dows, culture and commerce in the Gulf for a very long time were in inextricably linked. Um, without the dates harvested from Basra, from the Shat al-Arab, there could have been really no trade. They had nothing to sell, uh, nothing that anybody wanted. And so Basra's dates were really um, legendary. They were those beautiful honey dates that everybody wanted. And they permitted a lot of these places along the coast to expand. This is a photo of Kuwait's harbor. This is early 20th century, but it probably looked like this for many centuries before. Um, around the 18th century, um, these, um, these uh, commercial outposts started popping up on the Gulf Coast, and they became the cities we know today. Um, in 1765, the German explorer Kosten Niebuhr, traveling for the, for the uh, Danish government, noted seeing 800 dows in Kuwait's harbor. It's quite a big number in 1765. Um, by the 1780s, these dows were sailing to India, so Karachi and Bombay and Calcutta. And by the 1850s, they had reached the eastern coast of Africa, the, so the Swahili coast they would go all the way down to Zanzibar and beyond. And of course, when they, when they got to Zanzibar, they then journeyed south to the Rufiji Delta to pick up mangrove poles. And that was really the, the main reason they, they, they went to Africa, to, build, to, to bring back these poles so they could build homes, because they didn't have any wood. Um, but uh, for us, really, um, going back to the Dows and the Dates, um, it's worth mentioning these beautiful dows, so they're called boom sifar. Sifar, of course, means traveling, to travel. And these, these were the beginning of these long voyages, because these were the deep sea ocean going vessels. Before that, you would have dows, but they were smaller and they were reserved for regional use. 
Um, but around the 1780s, they started building larger, bigger ships, and they were able to sail, to sail further and further afield. These dumps were built uh, very interestingly. They were one-offs. The, um, the specialist carpenters and the master ship builders, they never had any drawings. They built them entirely by eye. Uh, and the only specification that mattered was the tonnage of dates. The ship was built to carry dates and nothing else. So the commissioning merchant, uh, Itajir, would go to a master ship builder and would say to him, I want a ship that can carry X number of dates, X number of tons of dates. And then they would build the ship accordingly. So again, dates and dows. And the, um, so the dow would leave uh, Kuwait's harbor in early September and would journey up to the Shat al Arab. And the reason it happened in September was because dates would start maturing in the summer. The maturity period of the date is from June, July, August. By September, they're ready to be harvested. And again, the, um, the seafaring season, most of the al Bahri, was always dictated by the date harvest season, most of the time. So dates and dows. Um, and here, I, I just added some photos just to, just to bring in the different hues of the different maturity um, uh, ripening um, phases of the dates. And you can see all the different hues. Um, in, in, in the end, of course, they turn yellow and then finally brown. <coughs> it takes a few months. But the captains, the Nukhavas, had to be ready because they had to catch their window and make sure that they were there at the right time. These are the beautiful date groves of Basra. They were legendary. By 1930, Basra was the largest exporter of dates in the world. They had the best dates, the best palm trees, and they produced the most honey dates. Um, they produced over 100 varieties of date palms. Within these, the four main types of dates were the Sayyir, the Burhi, the Hilawi, and the Zahidi. And each of these had its different markets. Some of them were very prized in Karachi, others were very prized in the Yemen, and so on. And so um, this, um, so so the Dows, oh, it was a mandatory trip to always go up to up to Iraq and then south. Um, and these are a few of these beautiful postcards just to show the incredible, incredible date groves. They were, the location of the date groves was actually very important because they were at the confluence of the Tigris and the Euphrates, and the salt, sweet water of the Shat made it so that the dates were just special. They were, they were really divine. Um, and here we have a Nochava, a captain. Nochava in Arabic is captain. Um, and like I said, the captains had to be ready. They had to be ready to go up to the shops in early September. And there was great competition between them because, of course, the first guy to get to the shot would be the first guy to get his cargo on board, the first guy to sail to India, the first guy to sell. So it was, you know, there was a lot of hustle and bustle. And they all raced against each other to pack, tightly pack the dates in these palm front baskets and then stow them in the belly of the ship as, and they, the dates also acted as ballast in the ships to weigh the ships out. So they had that dual uh, function. And interestingly, until 1850, um, Arabian horses fulfilled that function. So it would have been the horses to keep that kept the, the ship heavy. But 1850 came and the dates took over. And um, this guy, is Nejdi. Um, he was immortalized. He's a, nukhada, a famous Kuwaiti Nokhada, immortalized in the book Sons of Sindabad by Alan Villiers. I don't know if you're familiar with this book, but anyone interested in Arab seafaring should definitely read it. It's a wonderful account. Alan Villiers sails along, along the, 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 with the Dow and the crew and Nejdi, who becomes a firm friend of his. And he writes about this journey over nine months and just how difficult the life was for these sailors on board, how hard and arduous it was in those days. Um, but also how they had these simple pleasures um, and this camaraderie between them. And this is the Dao that he sailed on, Nejdi's Dao, the Triumph of Righteousness. Um, and the Triumph of Righteousness sailed, um, of course, all the way to East Africa and back many times over many years. And um, this, is the, this is a map of the route that they would have taken. This is also from the book, The, um, the Sons of Sindabad. 
And you can see here that Kuwait is very close to Basra and the Shat, and so it wouldn't have taken very long to get there. And then they would have sailed south, and they would always sail along the Persian coast, uh, coasting. And then once they get to the Strait of Hermes, and then at Matrah in Amman, then they would either turn left towards Karachi, Bombay, and Calcutta, or turn right towards uh, the Yemen, um, and then Eastern Africa and the Swahili coast. If you were going to India, you could fit two trips in within that nine month period. If you were going to East Africa, all you could fit in was just the one, the one time. East Africa, of course, um, would take about nine months return trip. India, you could do two trips within that nine months. And the, um, the sailing season, the, um, was always between September and May. It was that nine month period because you had to catch the wind, the monsoon winds. Um, if you found yourself not back at port by May, you were kind of in trouble. Um, the music I played earlier today, I don't know if you heard it. Um, I think I've got it on here. Yeah. Oops. Oh, never mind. Here we go. Um, it's seafaring music. The, um, the, sailors, the sailors really had no luxuries on board. It was, like I said, a very difficult life on board, very crowded, lots of passengers. But what they did have, the one luxury was a musician. And they always had a musician on every dab. And that was because music, they worked to the music. And music helped them, had helped lift their morales um, and help them. And you can see, you can see they're using the pava there. Um, help them go about their lives a little easier. Um, these are the mangrove hulls I'm talking about that they went down to East Africa to procure, and then they, they made their way back. Some of the some of the beautiful places that they saw along the way: Mukalla, Yemen, Jizan, Saudi, Ras Haifun in Somalia, and Lam. And of course, they were making for the great ports of Karachi. Um, and Mombasa, but there were a lot of places along the way, a lot of unsung places that were very ancient. Ras Haifun, for instance, is an ancient, ancient port in Somaliland, which I had never heard of. Um, so, so many of these places where they stopped were part of this interconnected network of port towns and cities where all the dams stopped and they traded, people came on, people went off, they picked up a lot of passengers, um, and when I started doing this work, I became really interested in some of these smaller places where they stopped, um, and places that possibly my grandfather and great-grandfather would have been very au okay fait with, but that for me and my generation, we really don't know very much about anymore. Um, and of course, they would, they would trade their, their dates along the route, and they would buy things to bring home, because there was not very much, not many foodstuffs back in port. Um, and then once they were back, they would be able to sell pretty much everything they got at these markets, at the souk, at the markets. Um, and from East Africa, for instance, they brought back bottled lemon juice because there were no lemons in the Gulf. And of course, lemons um, help you against the scurvy. And so they would, um, they would press the lemon into these bottles and add a pinch of salt and they would um, stow them and then sell them at the markets. Um, and, um, and this is where it gets interesting in terms of ingredients. So to East Africa, they would take dates, of course, but also cotton goods, salt, rice, beads, copper utensils, and rose water, and lots of passengers. And they would bring back um, a lemon, a bottled lemon juice, as I said. From Iran, they got a lot of ingredients. Of course, Iran, very close to the Gulf Coast and Eastern um, Arabia. And from Iran, of course, they would get rock salt, rose water, lots of nuts, walnuts and pistachios. Iran, of course, very famous for its walnuts, part of, and um, they figure very strongly in its fish and June dish. Um, they would also get the barley and the wheat, lots of dried fish, and of course, the saffron. Um, and we still get our saffron from Iran. I bought this saffron, this is just uh, in January when I was in Kuwait, uh, and the guy just opened this huge box, to, and I was just uh, astounded. There was so much of it, and it was really, really good. Um, but, of course, the one-stop shop remained India. India was where we got most of our foodstuffs. Uh, tea, of course, as well as spices and pulses. 
including cardamom, which went into your coffee today, coffee, um, achat, which are the preserved pickles, um, as well as some sugar, which I didn't, I didn't have a photo, and tobacco. And I, I wanted to just stop and talk a bit about the tobacco because it's still happening. Um, this is in Harag in, uh, in Bahrain. And this gentleman um, was selling his tobacco leaves to um, cars that just stopped and just placed an order and he would rush out with his tobacco leaves. So some things do continue. Um, and, but of course, our greatest import and the, the ingredient that would revolutionize our cuisine was the, the basmati rice, uh, in the Aish. <coughs> Aish, of course, is the Arabic word for living or life. Uh, which gives you an idea of how important it is in, in our culture. Um, it, um, it is known in different words throughout uh, the Gulf. Tinmen, for instance, in Iraq, Aish, Riz, Mashkul. Um, so we have um, a plethora of, of words to describe rice. Um, but really, it's, it's really impossible to imagine a lunch or a dinner without rice uh, in Arabia. I think I, I can safely say throughout the entire the entire peninsula of rice is a mainstay. Um, however, I will say one thing, that Aish in, for us in the Khalij means rice. However, in Egypt, Aish means bread. And that is a very important distinction. And that goes to show, obviously, the different agricultural um, environments um, and that for us, rice is the mainstay, the staple in Egypt and possibly also the western side of Arabia, bread also takes over. Uh, in Mishkal, the sieve, very, very important kitchen utensil. Um, you, you go to any market and, 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 and there's just, they're piled high. And that's because we sieve our rice. I don't know how many of you have cooked, you must have, have cooked um, rice this way, Mishkal. But it's basically, um, you, you parboil the rice, until it's al dente, and then you sieve, and by sieving you get rid of the starch, the starchiness, and then you would put, uh, put, the, put the rice back in the pot and steam it. The steaming is everything, it perfumes it. You can add pretty much any ingredient to your steam. Um, and this is a video that I wanted to show, just because rice, whoops, technology, okay, there we go. Um, this is a, um, I'm working with, um, with, that's all. That's all. That's all. <laughs> it's salt. <laughs> that's not me, by the way, but um, in her defense, <laughs> it's a lot of rice, and there's a lot of meat that goes into that. Yes, it's a lot of salt. So, so however, she tests the rice grain just to make sure that it's not entirely cooked. And then she sifts it, removes all the starch, Um, this is a Yemeni lady, actually, I work with in Ajman. I'm doing a lot of work with Yemeni communities at the moment. And she's already got her casserole of meat, yogurt, spices, and potatoes. She adds her rice to it. And... <laughs> <You're hungry. Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Good! <laughs> She actually uses a really interesting technique, and, and you'll see now. So she pours her saffron water. In her case, it was um, actually uh, coloring. I'm not sure why they don't use saffron, but she was using coloring. A drop or two of vegetable oil or butter, if you like, or some olive oil. Um, and then she puts the lid back on. Now, in her case, she also used a, um, an onion peeling, um, and she's um, and she added she added a, um, a piece of coal to um, to smoke it. So it's it's quite a unique, um, but it just gives you an idea of the way rice is cooked, and we call that dish mashkul, and mishkal, from the mishkal, which is the sieve. So it's sieved rice. And what you want to end up with is this, where every single grain is perfect um, and separate, where it's fluffy and aromatized. And you always top it with these onions that are um, caramelized. So 
I, I wrote down here all the different names of rice in, in Iraq. For instance, it's called Timman. We call it Aish. Some people call it Riz. My aunt calls it Chawan, which is, I think, the Indian, Indian term for it. So it's, um, it really is the staple. Pulses and spices. Pulses and spices, of course, uh, the Indian, uh, Indian imports. Mung bean, uh, mung beans, red, uh, red lentils, brown lentils, um, and split peas. All of these would go into our food. And this is what they would look like. We have innumerable rice recipes with all of these ingredients. A mahaddes with the yellow split peas, a mawash with the mung beans, uh, a muhammad with the date syrup, uh, and the non-veg options. Here, here it is. Uh, this is a stuffed fish, uh, a sinach, uh, king prawns, and our very, very own sort of our star dish, the mechbous, also known as the kapsa in Saudi, as the kabuli. It has so many different names throughout Arabia. But ask any Khaliji, any Eastern, Eastern um, Arabian what the star dish, what the national dish is, and he or she is likely to say majbus. Majbus, of course, is a rice-infused dish. It's the same technique I just described, so it's a template technique. Um, the meat would be cooked first, boiled, with the addition of spices. So you would throw in some cardamom pods, some cinnamon sticks, uh, a couple of cloves, you would cook the meat for about 40, 45 minutes, and then you would remove the meat, and that broth you would sieve, remove any impurities, and cook the rice. And so, of course, the rice would then mingle with all the different flavors. At the end, you would add the, mi the meat to the rice, um, and you would also add some hashu, some stuffing. So, uh, perhaps a bit of dried lime, uh, some raisins, uh, a little bit of saffron, and, and the whole would just get steamed. And so it's a very, it's a highly aromatized, aromatic, aromatized dish. And you always eat it with the dakus, which is a tomato sauce, very fresh tomato sauce. You could make it as fiery as you like or as mild as you like. Um, in our family, we don't go for too, too fiery, but I know some, some friends do. And papa is baby. Um, so like I said, the mechbus is a template. So you could, you could pretty much cook anything using that technique. Um, we have a very popular dish, which is a, um, um, a fish and rice dish, in um, the, 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 um, the fish that we use is a grouper, so very flat, white, white fish, very flaky white skin, pearl white, um, but we also use um, so Sedi uh, and Hamur, which is an emperor fish. And these, of course, come from the very, very rich waters of the Gulf, uh, they're, um, they're brought in every day, very fresh. We're very lucky. We have loads and loads of fish markets. This was one of my dad's favorite dishes, and I remember him as a little girl tucking in with his fingers. It's something you would eat with your fingers. Um, and just, yeah, it's really good. Um, another uh, variety of the mechbus is with fage. In the Gulf, in the desert, we have desert truffles. And they're called fage. And they're a delicacy. Um, they are really delicious, I can't tell you. But actually, and I, when I was a little girl, we would go on Fagir uh, expeditions into the desert, I remember so well. But I don't know if it's um, global warming or what, but really it doesn't happen anymore. Uh, Fagir is dependent on rainfall, so they're harvested in the winter. So obviously, if you've had enough rain, then you've got the desert truffles. But these, uh, these all came from Algeria. They're all sold in Kuwait, but they all come from Algeria. And there's an entire market that looks exactly like this. Every single stall with its red sort of carpet motif. I'm not really sure how they alighted on this, but it really works, and it's, it's a very interesting place to visit. And everybody's very, very friendly, and they love talking truffles. Um, this is, truffles are, of course, a delicacy. It's very seasonal. Um, you can also not have it with rice. It's really good with just a pinch of cumin and a bit of turmeric. Um, you've got to be careful not to, not to uh, take too much of the skin off, obviously. They're, they're quite spicy. But from India, we got a lot of other things. And of course, these are whole, wholesale foods from India, foods that they would have cooked there that we just took. So 
like the sambusa, the samosas, the potato chops, the chapatis. So um, our, our, our kitchen is very Indian influenced. But um, we're back at the Ramadan table, and I have to talk about the next food to touch your lips. Usually you start with a date, and then you move on to the soup. And usually it's shorbat adas, dal soup, um, red lentils, tomatoes, shredded vermicelli, and dried limes. I don't know how many of you know the dried limes. I brought some here. I'd like you all to have a look. You know, have a sniff. Um, they, uh, they're an ingredient that's absolutely um, tied to the peninsula. Uh, they're called lumi amani, limu in Persian, or lumi basra. Um, they are used um, in stews and soups to cut through um, very rich dishes. Um, they are dehydrated, and then when they come into contact with cooking heat, their uh, flesh starts to soften, and then they release a very tangy, very citrusy juice that marries very well with some of these quite heavy um, stews and soups. Uh, the powdered form, which I have here, um, which uh, is, is really, really very strong, uh, it works very well as a marinade um, for fish and lamb. Uh, we use it a lot in, in our cooking. And you can also boil these yeah. into a tea, a very highly digestive tea, uh, chai lumi. Um, it's, it's, it's one of the distinctive flavors of Arabia, I, I, would, I would say. So of course, my aunt's famous lentil soup. Um, and, um, and the vermicelli, I don't know if, if you're intrigued by it, but when I first started doing the research, I thought, what? How did the pasta, how did that happen? And, and actually, it's very interesting because it's, it's, a, it's an import. Um, it's an Indo-Persian import. And it came to us, of course, on several waves of migration. Uh, in the 18th century, tribes and families migrated south from Iran uh, into the eastern part of Arabia. And with them, they brought a lot of improvements to the local diet, including the shredded vermicelli. In Iran, they're called reshte, and they figure in their ash soup, very traditional Iranian soup. Um, we use them uh, in, in our soups as well, and they add heft to our food, um, and, and that's much needed. They, they also, in the Gulf, they've also been uh, turned into something very unique to us, um, a dish called balalit, um, which, um, which sounds funny, but actually is really, really delicious. And it's basically vermicelli, shredded vermicelli, sugar, saffron, and you always top it with an omelette. Balalit is a, uh, a, a very, a, a really a khaliji, khaliji dish. And um, there is quite a bit of controversy around it because I think it's a dessert. In my book, it's, it's actually under the dessert section. But were you to ask my aunt, she would say it's savory. And so this ambiguity allows her to have it for dinner, whilst <coughs> we would have it for breakfast. But it really makes everybody happy. It's very, very So I think sparingly um, it's very good. But again, it comes up at Ramadan. This is an image from a, a restaurant in Kuwait that makes it really well. Um, from the Persians, we got lots of, um, lots of wonderful foods. Of course, no less their, um, their art form, the kebab, skewery meat, but also uh, herb-rich stews like the sabzi. Um, and um, we also got something very unique, um, which is a, a dried anchovy paste which then gets spread onto flatbreads and cooked in an oven, and it's called mehiawa. Again, very specific to the Gulf region, uh, this mehiawa. And it's uh, very much this melting, it's, it's an example of a melting pot dish that came to us on the back of waves of migration. Um, and these different uh, influences, both Indian and Persian. Um, saffron, of course, from Persia, ended up in our halwa. These are the traditional halwas of the region of Eastern Arabia and the Gulf. Uh, they're made with very commonplace ingredients, cornstarch, sugar, water, uh, a bit of ghee or vegetable oil, and loads and loads of saffron, and topped with nuts. Uh, here they're topped with uh, cashews, and over there I think it's um, almonds. And the original version is amani. Amman was famous for its halwa, and in fact, 
these sailors on the Dows would always stop in Oman on their way home and buy some halwa. And it would be their way of celebrating almost the kind of reaching home, uh, buying the halwa and eating it on board the ships. Um, so the, the, these, uh, this is an image of um, a Bahraini halwa, and that's Qatari. Um, just slight, slight variation in color, but, but very typical of the region. Dessert, of course, you cannot, uh, you cannot envisage, envisage Ramadan without dessert. Dessert, however, would usually be eaten at a different time to iftar. So at iftar, you would have your main meal, your carbohydrates, your proteins, and these very sugary sweets you would reserve for later, possibly an hour or two or three even after the main meal. But you would always have these. The gaymats are very, very traditional at Ramadan. Uh, they're fried dough balls dunked in sugar syrup. Uh, they should be very crunchy. You should be able to crunch. But um, they're absolutely delicious. And halabiya, of course, is a Middle Eastern dessert uh, that uh, is well known in the Levant as well. But in the Gulf, we've added our own twist by making it with rice instead of cornstarch. Ghreba, uh, a an Indian-inspired uh, import made with chickpea flour. And uh, these are very, very crumbly biscuits, very sandy texture. And of course, date desserts. This is a rangina. And we have innumerable date desserts, as you can imagine, from the epicenter of date production. What would you get? You would get a lot of date desserts. Um, this is just four of them. My favorite is that fusa, also called the bathif, depending what country you're in. But they're very simply made. You never need sugar when you have dates. So they're made with flour, dates, a bit of vegetable oil or butter. Uh, they don't look like much, but they're actually very satisfying. Um, really, that one is, is delicious. And I make it here very often for English friends. They, they really love it. We yeah, add a bit of cream. Um, now, ah, oh, yes. One thing to add about these is they were also offered to mothers, new mothers. So they're also considered postpartum puddings. Um, in the Gulf, of course, uh, new mothers back in the day um, had their children at home with no medical care and so foods were used to heal and these were some of the foods that would be offered to a new mom because they were very easy to digest um, so easy on the digestion but they were also rich and very healing dates especially were considered very very healing so these would be part of a new mom's diet there were a lot of do's and don'ts for a new mom a lot of things she wasn't able to eat like yogurt and seafood but these dishes she was encouraged to eat. One of the dishes, one of the main postpartum puddings is the hisu. Hisu is a dish again uh, that came, came down to the Gulf from Iran. Hisu is, very, is, is a very similar dish to the ones I just showed, but has um, a massive amount of spice, especially ginger. And I think that's interesting because obviously ginger is a very warming spice. Um, and uh, the idea behind all of these postpartum puddings was to rid a new mom of any air that she might have accumulated. Um, so there's a bit of Ayurveda in there as well. And this is, uh, this is our little Hisu uh, expedition. Um, a, a very good friend of mine introduced me to it. And uh, tons of spices go into the spice mill nowadays. In the, in the early days, they would have done this by hand. But back to the Ramadan table. And we looked at a lot of dishes that came to us from somewhere else. But what, what came to us from the land, from Arabia itself? These are the porridges uh, that we call haris and madruba. And these, of course, were dishes. These are ancient dishes, very, very, very old dishes. And they're dishes that came about as a, as a result of scarcity. Obviously, very few ingredients in Arabia. Um, but they were, they're also dishes that tolerate substitution. So if you're out of rice, you could, you could use oats. If you're out of oats, you, you use cracked wheat or wheat berries. And the way they work is they, this is slow food. They're cooked for up to four hours. So you'd either use uh, white meat, so uh, chicken or lamb, and your, your uh, grains. And you would cook, it would cook and cook and cook. And then finally, you would beat them into a sort of porridge, just like that. Um, you have different consistencies of porridge throughout Arabia. This one is quite loose, it's quite watery. Again, very easy on the digestion. This is another dish that would be offered in new mum. 
um, very nourishing. Uh, and of course, in the desert, it would keep you full for long periods of time. So it's also a dish that would work if you have a nomadic lifestyle. Um, this is a, an example of a Yemeni uh, porridge called Basweet, very, very popular in Yemen. Um, it is actually really, really delicious. Unfortunately, this is the only photo I have, but it's, it's in, and the consistency is much more akin to a dumpling. So it's much, much thicker and more rubbery than the previous dish. But I wanted you to see again the technique uh, here. I wonder, is this, uh, whoops. Okay, there we go. It takes, it, it is quite, it's quite a technique. I wasn't able to do it. Uh, they were showing me how to do it, but it was, it was impossible. Because you actually have to get the paddle up against the side of the pan and then just keep going and keep going and keep going until it's very, very smooth. But this is again another example of these hinterland, of these very, very Arabian dishes that came from a Bedouin aesthetic, very rustic dishes. Um, more rustic dishes. Uh, these are called teshriba, uh, matazis, and tarid, different names depending where you are. But these are bread fortified stews. Uh, again, based on the same theme, um, the fact that you would have very few ingredients in the desert, but what you did have was wheat usually. And so you could make these uh, wafer thin breads that then would be soaked in marags, in stews. Um, and they would add heft, they would add nutritional value to these subsistence diets. And of course, these, um, these soups or these stews that have the dumplings in them, these, these can be found in, in so many different cultures. In Eastern Europe, um, in, in Asia, throughout Asia, they're very common to so many cultures. And I think they're very, very old dishes because clearly they come from, from, from the fact that there was very little to hand but people manage somehow to feed themselves and, and, and these are some of the dishes that make an appearance at Ramadan. They always remind us of that time, uh, that time when, when really there was, we had nothing um, in the desert. Um, so Yemen, I talked a bit about the different breads that come from Yemen, a society that, that uh, bakes and eats so many different types of breads. I wanted to illustrate just a few of them. This is Khubza Khmir Hadrami. Um, I call it the Yemeni focaccia. It, it has the same texture, very springy, very olive oily. It's absolutely delicious. And this is khubza fawa. And khubza fawa means it's cooked on a metallic sort of ring that would be placed on a hob. Um, they use nigella seed a lot in their breads, which we don't use in Eastern Arabia. Again, an, an ingredient uh, that, uh, that's very unique to, to them. Uh, this is uh, the zurgyan, Yemeni meat zurgyan. It's a majestic dish, as you can see. This is the dish that the lady was cooking in the video, the, the salt. Um, and um, she added the meat, lots of potatoes. It's very spicy. It's a wonderful, it's a, it's a beautiful dish, actually. And um, I also wanted to talk, I talked to a lot about the, the um, Indian subcontinent and East Africa, but I haven't really talked about the Malay Peninsula. And there was actually a lot of travel to Malaya, uh, especially from the Hadramut, from Yemen. Uh, they were great travelers, and they went further than most, most uh, Arabs from the peninsula. This is a dish called murtabak. It's a street food, very, very popular in Singapore, Malaysia, and Indonesia. It's, it's a sort of uh, spring roll, kind of a giant spring roll, uh, with mincemeat, potatoes, vegetables, and so on. And the, um, the inspiration for this dish is called mutabbak. That's the Arabic version of the dish. And the, um, the story goes that it was actually taken to Malaya by these Arab sailors, by the Hagramis, um, and adopted there. And I can believe that because when I went to Singapore a few years ago, this is the Arab quarter in Singapore. Um, I met a lady there selling clocks, and we started talking. And she was telling me that her great grandfather had come on the ships from the Yemen. She was Singaporean; she couldn't speak Arabic, but she had, she still had that cultural connection. So it's interesting to see that really, um, there's, it's an Indian Ocean 
um, influence. We were talking about uh, Arabia, but really it is the entire Indian Ocean that we're looking at. So what, if anything, was um, produced in Arabia? We, we got a lot of our ingredients from abroad, but what, what came from, from the land? And what came from the land are things that would come from livestock. Um, uh, during, uh, during the year, as the dows would be out, the dows would be out for nine months at a time, there was a parallel trade going on inland. And that was the trade whereby the, Bedou, uh, the, uh, the Bedouins and the townsfolk from the interior would come to the coast and trade. And that would be called Musabala, the Musabala. And the Bedouins um, the, uh, would come in with their wares, and a lot of the time it was dairy products that they would sell in order then to buy things that they needed, a lot of the things that would come on aboard the Dows. Um, they would, of course, sell their goat milk, their camel milk, but as well as their ghee. Uh, ghee is still very much uh, used in the cuisine, sparingly, but still, still a feature. Uh, and this lady very recently um, approached me and wanted to, um, to sell some of her ghee. This is a home, home business. A lot of women do this in the Gulf to make a little bit of money on the side. Um, and um, what else comes from, from Arabia? Well, of course, date-derived products, Mayligah. We've all heard of orange blossom water and rose blossom water, but do we know that we also have palm, palm water? Uh, but palm essence water comes from the efflorescence of the palm, so the flower, which is boiled in water. Uh, it's, it's, a lovely, it's a lovely product because uh, just a drop or two in your drinking water actually uh, really revives, revives you. Basra date syrup, of course, um, another very important product. Date syrup or date juice um, has actually been in production for several millennia. Uh, it, is, it is a very, very old product and it's very typical to Eastern Arabia and the Gulf region. And the reason I know that is because of Bahrain's fort. Um, this is Bahrain's fort. It, um, it dates from the second millennium BC. And you can see very clearly here the medbasa, the date press. And the way the date press worked is um, sacks of dates. So, so this would be a sealed room, darkened and sealed. And sacks of dates would be placed on top of the grooves. And with the heat and the weight, um, the syrup would flow out into the grooves and into a channel and then be collected in a jar. Uh, as you can see, it's a dark room, um, airtight. This is Fujera. This is the oldest fort in the UAE, dating from between 1500 and 1550, Fujera's fort. And they had their very own date syrup press. So they knew something about gastronomy. Um, this is in Harag, another date press. Uh, this one adorns a very trendy restaurant now, a restaurant where you can have your balalit. And, um, and many, many others have been unearthed recently, uh, especially in Zubara, in Qatar. Uh, apparently, uh, there's an entire complex of them, 27 in close proximity, which obviously means that there was a, a date producing, it was a factory. So what happened to the trade? Um, the trade ended, of course, after World War II, uh, the maritime trade, um, and as, um, as the oil was discovered and oil riches were flowing in, but also as, as boats became mechanized. So there was really no use for the, for the Dows. So the Dows have gone quiet, they've been retired, they're now museum artifacts. They still look out onto the ocean, but they've gone, they've gone quiet. Um, and their Nochebes, the captains, were also retired. The last captain to retire in 1957, uh, Isa Yagul Bishara, was given a government job. Um, but of course, there's still a vestige of that time, uh, that time not so long ago. Uh, this now is Kuwait's harbor. You can see the difference, but it's still a harbor. It's still got a lot of boats. Uh, but most of these boats today are fishing vessels, and these are some of the Smiley fishermen working there, and they would have, um, they would have caught some of the fish that I showed earlier. Uh, this, incidentally, is the central bank building. Um, so things have changed, but they're still, um, still also not so different. 
But finally, um, <clears throat> although the, the DAOs have stopped and the maritime trade has stopped, something of the uh, connection with India still goes on. And that's, of course, in, in these gentlemen who, who now reproduce some of these dishes. My aunt's cooks, for instance, Tony and Hassan, uh, they would have been taught all the local recipes, all the traditional recipes. Um, the way this works is the cook, the new cook, would make the round of homes, would go to family members who had a recipe to teach. Um, and the, 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 the wonderful thing I find is that my aunt taught Tony, and Tony taught me. Um, and, and the circle of life continues, continues this way. Sorry, my, my voice is um, So we started with a date, and we have to end with coffee. A coffee, of course, and dates go hand in hand. It's part of the Arabian hospitality. These are um, Yemeni coffee merchants. Um, and the coffee that you had today came from this shop uh, in Kuwait. They're still able to get their coffee um, through the Hadramut. Um, and um, I hope that was informative enough. It's a massive region, there's so much data, but I tried to give you an overview as much as I could.